Hey nerds, what's up? Today we'll be talking about why we can accept this, but not this. See you after the jump. We've all heard of the phrase suspension of disbelief before, but I hadn't given it much consideration until I watched Jurassic World a few years ago in the theater. I think we were all a little surprised by the scene where someone runs from a T-Rex in heels. And I remember after watching that movie and the kind of silly uproar about that scene, someone made a meme that said, I like how you can accept dinosaurs in a world, but not woman running in heels. And ever since that meme, a little seed was planted in my brain. I wanted to know, why is that? Why is it that we are fine accepting something as big as dinosaurs coming back to life, but not something as small as someone running from a T-Rex in heels? So I decided to do a little research about it and find out why. So if you're interested, come join me and we're gonna dig into the psychology of suspension of disbelief. In general, suspension of disbelief represents an audience's willingness to accept fiction in the media they consume. It's the sacrifice of realism for the sake of enjoyment. The idea of a suspension of disbelief dates back to Aristotle. He developed his catharsis theory to explain why people were emotionally invested in plays, poems, and art. However, the term wasn't coined until the late 1700s by a man named Samuel T. Coolidge. What's important to know about the full phrase he coined is that it's actually the willing suspension of disbelief, meaning that we agree to believe in fictional things. It's the audience that gets to decide if and when we suspend our disbelief. This is mostly omitted when we talk about the suspension of disbelief, but I think it's an important distinction. He coined it while working with the poet Willem Wordsworth. They believed that the consumer had poetic faith in fiction that allowed them to consume it willingly, even when it didn't match reality. What I found interesting while researching this topic is that a lot of the discussion around suspension of disbelief deals with the fact that as humans, we get very invested in fictional characters. I never thought of that as a weird thing, but I guess it is weird that we get upset or emotionally invested, that we may cry or shout or be depressed when something happens to someone we know doesn't exist. I never thought of it as cogn dis cognitive dissonance, but it sort of is. Um, the only thing research really has to say about this strange occurrence is that our brain allows us to suspend reality and pretend that these individuals are real. A part of our brain realizes this isn't true. For example, when we watch a horror movie, we aren't actually scared we're going to die, we're just scared at what's happening on screen. But the brain is powerful and it fools us. Reacher's into research in the late 2000s onto willing suspension of disbelief slightly alters Coolidge's original thoughts. Psychologist Richard Gehrig posits that when you subject yourself to any narrative, you believe it for the time that you are comprehending it. Then he also said that we can, after our brain is able to parse whether or not what we believe and disbelieve within that narrative. Garrick says that we can, one, have poetic faith even in the most improbable things, but that we can demonstrate that faith only experimentally. And that three, we also have a rapid system in the brain that allows us to believe, but also judge the probability of what we've seen and what we believe or disbelieve proportionally. These distinctions that Gehrig makes are important because it highlights that it is willing on our part. We have to be willing to accept these things that we believe or disbelieve. Okay, so you're like, so what? What does it mean? I found all this information about suspension of disbelief extremely interesting, and it's led me to some conclusions of my own that I think answer our T-Rex heels conundrum. The umbrella for that is suspension of disbelief involves precision on the part of the artist. This is a statement by Anthony J. Ferry, and I think it gets to the heart of the matter. When an author or director or whoever is creating something, a fantasy, they need to be precise in the way that it is presented to us so that we can not enter the, the stage of making judgments on that, but rather just let ourselves enjoy the medium. And based on my research, I feel like this precision comes down to two things. And the first of that is that the reality of the fantasy world needs to remain consistent. 
This is a big one, and I think this is when um, most of what we conceive as plot holes uh, come to play in fantasy. We as consumers are more than willing to accept the fantasy world that is set up as long as those rules are consistent and that the author or director follows them at all times. Uh, some examples that immediately came to my mind in fiction um, were The Wheel of Time and The Lord of the Rings. And now I'm gonna be like specifically vague on The Wheel of Time example because I don't wanna give away major spoilers, but a lot of fans were very frustrated by a character Egwene's ending in The Wheel of Time, and I won't go into that, so it's spoiler free. But we were frustrated by her ending because a, an object named Kalendor had been set up in a certain way early on in the series, and Egwene's ending kind of violated what we believed we knew about these magical artifacts. And it frustrated me when I read it. And so it'd be easy for someone to say, well, this is a magical world and you've accepted 13 books of crazy magical things, so why can't you accept this piece? And the reason our brains can't accept it is because it's not logical and it doesn't fit the world that has been set up. And that is important. Uh, the famous example from The Lord of the Rings is why didn't the eagles carry Frodo to Mordor? It's done! Now I know I've seen all the discussions for the narrative reasons why this isn't true, so don't come at me, okay? I know. But it's a question for a reason. It's a question because it triggers something in us that doesn't feel quite consistent. And consistency is important when we talk about fantasy. It's how our brain can accept what's going on. Okay, and the second point is that we are more critical on things that we have experienced. Or in other words, we expect human nature to remain the same. I think there is a reason that most fantasy is based on some sort of earth culture. Now in the past that had has been mostly Eurocentric literature, but I feel like it's great that recently things have really been expanding in the mainstream to explore other earth cultures and fantasy. Um, and our novels are better for it and more interesting. But I think the reason for that is that when we're asked to accept very fantastical and magical and these very difficult things maybe, magic systems or whatnot, it's nice to have something rooted in what we know, which is usually human interaction, right? It's what we know, it's what we've experienced. Um, and this point, I think, is what gets to the root of our T-Rex and heels problem. Um, that it's easy for us to get into a suspension of disbelief for large things that we know that haven't happened or that we haven't experienced, but things that we have experienced take us straight out of the suspension of disbelief. So look, as far as I know, none of us have been hunted by some monstrous monstrosity of a dinosaur. None of us have trained velociraptors. And so our brain's like, okay, this is fun. I can accept this. I like this. Let's, let's deal with the fantasy. But then every person that has worn heels and watches that scene is like, what? <laughs> I mean, if I remember correctly, it's not even a scene that happens randomly. It's a premeditated chase because I'm pretty sure the character whose name I don't remember, um, she has this idea for the T-Rex to battle the other dinosaur they've created. And so she gets a flare, she goes to the T-Rex cage, opens it, gets it to follow the flare and runs away. So it's like at no point while she's developing this plan, she's like, I should take my shoes off. I should get more comfortable shoes on. Like, it just doesn't make any sense. And I think that's the problem. Um, I mean, even like the part of her traveling through the jungle, like I thought she still has her heels on. Like anybody who has walked in heels across grass knows that it's not very fun. Um, and so I think that's the problem. It's not that our brain is like, I can't accept this reality. It's just that it's lived that reality. At least I have. I've lived the reality of walking or running in heels and I know what it feels like. And so that's what takes me out of the suspension of disbelief. So yes, I can accept a dinosaur. No, I can't accept someone walking in heels or running in heels. Um, and this I think is consistent with other plot holes that we find in books. Um, one famous example I think of is uh, the criticism for Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. When we talk about plot holes in that book, a lot of people bring up that Voldemort's plan to get Harry is just way too intense and way too involved. And it's like no part of us questions flying broomsticks or dragons or magical wands or horses, I guess that's not in the fourth book, well whatever thing that we see in Harry Potter. But we do question a character motivation or a character action because those are things that feel real and they feel like they're in life. 
So ultimately, I think it's really normal that large scale things don't bother us, but small faux pas do in fantasy. I think that's just our brain interpreting what we know and what we don't know. So I hoped you liked this mini deep dive into suspension of disbelief. I know I enjoyed learning a little bit more how our brains parse fantasy. And if you wanna find out more, I'm going to link all of my sources in the description box so you can do a little reading on your own. And if you liked this video, please subscribe and like it and comment and tell me what you think. And you can also follow me on Instagram to see what I'm currently reading. So I'll see you next week. Thanks for coming. Bye. In Legion's breath, when I see what you mean, I thought there's like so much more than just four. There's like, I think there's 10. That is, I think there's a lot. Okay, I have to do something. So can you go close the door real quick? Thank you.